Hashim, we'd love to welcome you tonight. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking the Socialist Alliance for uh, making it possible for me to come here. Uh, I would also like to return to how anti-terrorism laws have worked out in Australia. Uh, I, I would share the sentiment with you that anti-terrorism laws in Pakistan also operate as anti-workers laws. Uh, anti-activist laws and we will, I will slowly get to explaining how that comes about but I would, I will stick to the context of Pakistan, I think that's more comfortable for me. Uh, I would like to set out this, uh, well, pseudo idea that we've thrown, uh, that somehow militaries, uh, the US military or in Pakistan, the Pakistani military will be able to save us from either the Taliban or Al-Qaeda, whatever they may be. And that this is interconnected with the idea that we are ready to bear all civilian costs that in pursuance of uh, ending this so-called threat. Uh, now, there are about three incidents in recent history that I would just, recent history in Pakistan that I would like to quote and try to break down uh, and try to explain why this idea doesn't really hold true. Uh, one, uh, on January 10th this year, as uh, you would all probably know, that in Quetta there was an attack. Uh, there were two bombs against Shia Hazaras. Uh, 86 Shia Hazaras died. Uh, the attack was claimed by the lashkar e Subsequently, there was a four, day, four day sit in uh, where the, the Shia Hazara said they wouldn't uh, bury the bodies and demanded that Quetta be taken over by the military. I have my critique of that and I will get to that. Uh, the second incident is yesterday, actually, uh, January 17th, where 18 uh, tribesmen of the Afridi tribe, one of the Pashtun tribes, were killed by Pakistani armed forces, uh, armed gunships shot them down. They took bodies, the bodies of the tribesmen to the Peshawar Press Club, put them out and said, we will stay here until action is taken against the military. But the military came and picked up those bodies and took them away and asked them to disperse. Uh, and that will get to the context. And third, uh, the attacks on polio workers, uh, which were in the last weeks of December, which caused great outrage, but also interconnect with how imperialism is at the heart of all that is wrong and all the origin of fundamentalism within Pakistan. Uh, so just to put context, to let's just actually begin to unravel uh, the incident that happened just yesterday. Uh, 18 tribesmen were killed, but there's there's an entire context to that. Uh, the context is the occupation of the northwest frontier province now of Hyber Pakhtunkhwa by the Pakistani army for the last 10 years. But before that, uh, it, it goes even before that, which goes to the social engineering, the social re-engineering of the Pashtun populations by the US, the Pakistan army and Saudi Arabia, uh, where in terms and as, as socialists, we all do remember the first Afghan war, uh, where, where the threat of the Soviet Union was constructed and uh, America pumped in money to the Gen General Zia's Islamist dictatorship in Pakistan. And that dictatorship responded by taking the people of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, which uh, if we would all go back into history, had a strong secularist, uh, secularist tradition, uh, which goes back to Bacha Khan. Uh, Bacha Khan, if we remember, was aligned with the Indian National Congress. He was a follower of Gandhi and was a, was, was a secular individual. One who did not support the joining of uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa with Pakistan. Uh, and subsequently, even now, 
the political party in uh, power in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa is the Awami National Party, which overtly is a secular party. Uh, it has problems in terms of its alliances with the US, and we can critique it, but it has also suffered. Uh, only recently, one of its le leaders, uh, Bashir Balor, was, was killed in a, uh, uh, well, a terrorist attack. Uh, so, 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 so the, it, it is the social reconstruction of this entire area, uh, area and people that, that is responsible for first the killings in the, the 80s. No one, no one asked the Pakistan military or the US why, or Saudi Arabia, which we still love for some reason, uh, is, 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 is what of those young men that went out and fought the Soviets for, Islam, for this so-called Islam and died in the midst? And what about the, the entire future of these people? And then suddenly we move to 2001 and suddenly the Taliban that uh, Ronald Reagan once brought to the White House and said these are akin to the founding fathers of the US suddenly become enemy number one. And, and then the Pakistan military, which has bred this relationship with the Taliban, uh, with suddenly has faces this choice of, well, delinking to it. And it doesn't, because it has its strategic interest. It doesn't. It has this love-hate relationship with the US, where the Musharraf, where the Musharraf dictatorship is also backed by the US. Uh, more aid flows into Pakistan under dictatorships uh, than to civilian governments. Uh, but civilian governments somehow become corrupt. Uh, and uh, every five years, as you guys might have been hearing, there was just another attempt to somewhat manufacture a coup or set up a technocratic government in which the military would be a part of, which for once the political forces showed majority, including our own party, by being very firm and saying that we want the next elections to go ahead. Uh, not that everything's fine, but, but, but that the Pashtun populations have been on the fire, firing line in the context of the war on terror. Uh, I mean, it was the war on terror before too, only when communists were the enemy. Uh, and Islamists would be used against communists. And, and now it has come to the point where Pashtun populations can be sacrificed in the name of uh, these so-called so -called war of war on terror. Uh, again, within that context, there have been two major operations in Khyber Pakhtun Khwa over the past uh, five years. One, 2009 in Sabah where the military manufactured this deal with the uh, Taliban and a couple of other parties to allow Sharia rule in Sabat. And about five days later, they released this video of this girl being flogged, deeply, deeply sad, deeply... Uh, and, and yet, I mean, it was learned later that it was planted in to create this sense that an operation was needed which resulted in uh, one of the greatest uh, internal displacements in over the past 10 years. 1.2 million people from Sabah moved to, tried moving to the Punjab, to, to, but the government of Punjab said we're not going to let them in. They tried moving to Sindh, and that's where racism within Pakistan, racism and intersects with notions of uh, religious fundamentalism, but also very deeply deep insecurities about economic well-being, uh, is that two groups that never saw eye to eye, the Mutaheda Qaumi movement, which is, uh, and Sindhi nationalists, uh, which have fought over Sindh, and, and who own Sindh, which is the southernmost province, uh, southeastern province in, in Pakistan, actually came together and said, we will not let Pashtun Taliban enter uh, Sindh. And we will kill them and we will set, set people on... Uh, and, and it's, so, so, so that's how 
I mean, Pashtun populations got uh, labeled as Taliban. Uh, you could photograph a Pashtun and literally run him uh, via any international agency and say, hey, there's a Taliban running around. Uh, and uh, similarly, in 2011, when I was, I had joined the media back then, I was working in a newspaper. And every day we would get reports that there was an operation at Aurakzai. Uh, which is in the north, again, Khaiba Pakhtunkha, where 18 terrorists have been killed without naming anyone, without telling us who it is, without telling us whether any of them are foreign militants or local militants or civilian populations. And, and that is where it links into this particular incident yesterday, which I can assure you will be hushed up. No one will remember it tomorrow, no action will be taken, where finally for once, uh, it's not drones that have killed uh, military uh, uh, persons, but in fact this was filmed that the Pakistan military killed them. But no one's going to ask that. There has been a massacre going on there. But let's, let's, let's move to the second massacre, which has been going on in Balochistan. Again in the name of uh, the war on terror, partly, but also a very internal war, which, where also there's a different kind of terror. So, uh, the Baloch nationalist movement has been fairly strong and been revived after Musharraf decided to kill uh, Akbar Bhukti, uh, a Nawab and relatively, well, quite problematic uh, Baloch leader from the past, but in, in the moment he was killed, he had gained some support. Uh, and once he was killed, the Baloch nationalist movement got a new spur, a new insurgency started. And then since 2007, Baloch students, Baloch activists, were being picked up by this province that was only under the control of the military. And frankly, it's been under the control of the military since 47, uh, when, when Pakistan's partition was created after the partition. And uh, so, so in between, uh, while, while on one side, as progressives, we were trying to build discourse around the, the killing of Baloch, uh, the, the complete uh, overshadowing of any form of civilian administration within Balochistan. Uh, we have the, the rise of the Hazara conflict, which again, Hazara targetings have go back to the 1990s. But let's trace the history of the Lashkar-e uh, It is another bestowance upon Pakistan of the connection between the Pakistani, the Islamizing Pakistani state, uh, U.S. imperialism and Saudi imperialism. Uh, the Lashkar-e Jhangvi was brought in to kill the Shia populations. If we remember that uh, in '79 the Iranian Revolution happened, uh, and there were fears uh, that. With the, that, that America expressed to Pakistan saying that we do not want this to happen in Pakistan too and that Shia populations needed to be controlled. Shia populations also provided the most, some of the strongest opposition to the Sunniizing project of, of the, uh, Sunni Deobandi project of the then Pakistani state. Uh, they took out a three day, three they uh, sit in outside the presidency in 1980, uh, where they tried to, they argued that they shouldn't be included in zakat laws, which are, which is a religious uh, duty that uh, is that the state wanted that be given to itself, and they managed to get their space out. But what the state responded by doing was suddenly realizing, oh, this community can be powerful, is, is creating these splinter groups, uh, proxies. Uh, this proxy called the Sepai Sahaba Pakistan, which was designed to kill Shias and target Iranian consulates. And it is that transmuted into the lashkar e Jhangvi of today, which was then, is now operating as I understand when I went into, uh, I went to Quetta in 2011, to get some sense around what's going on, because Hazara targeting was was getting uh, was increasing back then too, is that the Lashkar-e-Jhangvi would be able to go into the Quetta press club, 
uh, a highly securitized zone, uh, completely dominated by the military. You go through three army pickets to get there. They would get into the Quota press club and tell the press club uh, president that you need to get this press release printed which says Shias are infidels and worthy of being killed. And, 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 and so the deep interconnection between the state uh, of Pakistan and uh, the so-called ideas of terrorism uh, is, is there. And it, it draws from the state's legitimation and its, its particular articulation of American interest. And we can also go on to what the attacks of, on polio workers. Uh, all right, I will just finish it out. Uh, on, on, on polio workers. Uh, they take in from really the, the so-called raid on Osama bin Laden. A uh, man who's supposedly defunct, uh, his organization is being shattered. Suddenly you have this raid. Uh, and the US then chooses to reveal that one of the people that let them find this out was this uh, vaccinator uh, who was giving vaccine on a hepatitis B program. It gets misconstrued as polio. And, and subsequently the Taliban can say that these are legitimate targets. And now that, that is imperialism deciding that it can put at stake the lives of and health of millions of people, millions of children in Pakistan uh, for, for the sake of this one defunct man. Uh, well, let, let, let me just move on and just quickly get to the uh, anti-workers aspects of, of the anti-terrorism legislation. Uh, the anti-terrorism legislation in Pakistan was not introdu introduced after 2001. So it was introduced in 1997 uh, during the Nawaz Sharif uh, government. Uh, uh, the legislation from that point, and as you said, it, it has increasingly permeated every part of criminal law. You see cases, uh, well, I, I can name you a few. So Baba Jan is a case, uh, an activist who was protesting against the uh, the creation of this lake uh, due to climate change in Gilgit Baltistan. He got put on, in under, under terrorism laws. Uh, five workers, power room workers in Faisalabad are still serving sentences under anti-terrorism law. Uh, there's a documentary I will show you tomorrow of uh, this area where I've been trying to organize people called Terra Cycle. Uh, where tenants were attempted to be forcibly removed, and when they fought back, they were charged under anti-terrorism laws. So anti-terrorism laws really become a way of curbing resistance in Pakistan. Uh, of course, criminal laws also do, which is something I can discuss in in in, in the talk I'm doing yesterday, uh, tomorrow. Uh, so thanks a lot. I, I love it.